Hello and welcome to Hornbill Local Weekend Horn. I am here in the studio with Son Colin Mate, Research Scholar, Philosophy of Science, IIT Mumbai. Today we are here to discuss a very vital topic, fundamentals of science and religion relation. Hello, Lynn. Welcome to the studio. We are glad to have you here. So can you please kindly tell us something about your educational background? A little thing about my education background is that I completed my uh, undergraduate BSc Honor Physics from Hindu College, Delhi University. Right after that, I went to IIT Roorkee to pursue my MSc MTech in Geophysical Technology. And after that, I shift to philosophy. And presently, I'm pursuing my uh, PhD in philosophy of science from IIT Bombay. That draws my curiosity. First of all, why should you see from your science background to philosophy? What's the reason for that? That question has been asked to me by many people. The answer that I give is that since my undergraduate days, there are many burning questions that has been hunting me. Example, what is the meaning of life? What is the source of life? What is the universe that we live in? What is all these things that we are doing? And many other questions that... And I find that science could not answer those questions. That made me look somewhere else. And I find uh, those answers in philosophies and uh, theology and religions, uh, to be precise. This is going to get really interesting. Straight away, let's delve deep into that topic. My first simple question is, can you tell us what religious belief and how do we derive it? Religious belief is belief about the divine. The divine is a thing, a principles, or any matters that is self-dependent and whose existence doesn't depend on others. And all things that exist in the universe depend on it for their existence. Believe about that divine schools, uh, religious belief. To talk about how we derive religious belief, we have to look at uh, the Greeks' understanding of it. The mainstream Western traditions is indebted to Plato and Aristotle and Descartes on these very matters. The Greek concept is that they make this dichotomy, episteme, that is, they call it knowledge, that is certain and self-evident, that means no need to be proved. Example, they will call the order of cosmos as divine, as in the laws of physics, laws of mathematics, because they are independent and they don't change. Belief about those, they will call it religious belief, and they will qualify it to be knowledge, that they call it epistemes. And they will not call knowledge derived from other sources as religious belief or knowledge. They call it male opinion. Example, belief derived through perceptions, memories, introspections, etc. But the Christian consensus of religious belief is different in the sense that the Christian doesn't make the dichotomy. According to the Christian uh, faith, religious belief is derived through experiences, through direct encountering with God. Is Christian faith blind trust, belief beyond evidence, or belief despite evidence? Can you tell us something? Can you throw some light on this question? That question is a very interesting question. We could say that uh, whether Christian faith is derived from experience or not. Now we have to look at what faith is. 
the New Testament writers use faith in three senses. Now let me talk about the scan senses. Faith as trust in someone. For example, trust in the promise of God. Then what does this trust in the promise of God according to Christian defend? We look at the covenantal faithfulness of God in the Bibles. And on that basis, we trust in the promise of God. Then we believe in God. The Christian faith is derived from evidences. And it is not a blind faith. Okay, that's a very interesting explanation that Christian faith is not a blind faith. Can you tell us how Christian faith or Christian religious belief differs from that of heathen, Greek religious belief? As I have already mentioned in the first questions, the Greek or the Haitian make this uh, dichotomy between epistemes and epistas. And they disqualified epistas or male opinion or belief derived from perceptions, memories, or introspections uh, from knowledge. According to Christians, we don't maintain that dichotomy. And our Christian conception of faith is uh, close to pistas. Now, we have to look at what that is. Looking at the Bibles, we find uh, the prophet encountering God, as of Moses, encountering God in Mount Sinai. That means the Christian faith is derived from uh, experiences. Experiencing the reality of God. Experiencing God personally. And that is self-evident. That is certain. That is as certain, as self-evident as 2 plus 2 equal to 4. That means certainty is our everyday experiences. Example, you asking me questions and I responding to you at this moment is as certain to you as 2 plus 2 equal to 4. Whereas the Greek will not go that as certain. But according to the Christian concept, certainty or self-evident is everyday experiences. And religious belief, according to Christian, as we have mentioned, is encountering God and his reality as recorded in the Bible. So can the existence of God be proven then? About the questions, we need to look at the structure of the argument. Then we talk about proof we talk, talk about the structure of the argument, argument and premises, and conclusions drawn from those premises. What constitutes those premises? The laws of nature, for example, the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the laws of logics, the laws of biology. All these things are created aspect of reality, created by God. Something that we prove during those created realities are, is another created realities. So a created realities which is proven from other created realities, realities used as premises could not be equivalent to God. So God is the creator of everything and anything that is proved during those created realities could not be equivalent to God. So the existence of God could not be proven. However, there are different arguments that we can, that can be given to support the, the existence of God. As I put the cosmological argument, ontological arguments, moral argument, etc. 
they are used as tools in our apologetics of Christian faith. So, existence of God cannot be proven, but argument for his existence can be given. We have been talking about science and religion, the relations between science and religion. And when we are talking about this subject, there is one part of the aspect which we cannot deny. That's about science and miracle. We have seen lots of miracles in the Old Testament. As Christians, we strongly believe that God has performed lots of miracles. There are countless number of miracles. The question that I want to ask you in regards to miracle. Then tell us something about miracle and how we may conceptualize it as we may proceed with its relation with science. The term miracle has been used in different ways and has been used liberally this day. Example, miraculous successes, etc. But that, con that way of utilizing the term miracles is somewhat misleading. When we talk about miracles, what does it mean? Miracles is something that cannot be generated or produced by natural law or natural event or natural mechanisms that need something outside the universe to produce it that we call as miraculous event. Paradigm example of miracles in the Bible are is there a light crossing the Red Sea? Or Lazarus raising from the dead. Those even could not be uh, generated or produced through natural laws or mechanisms. That need the intervention of God, who is outside this universe and also in this universe. That brings us to a very interesting question. We have seen miracles after miracles. One of them is Jonah surviving inside the feast. And also lots of other miracles where Peter is walking in the water. So the next question I want to ask you, does science rule out possibility of miracles? To answer the question, we need to look at what question science can investigate and what question science cannot investigate. So, looking at its proper light, we could say that science could not rule out miraculous event. Having heard your answer, that brings me to the next question that I'm curious to ask you. So, Len, tell us something about classical science and explain to us whether or not it contradicts miracle. When we talk about uh, classical sciences, we talk about determinism. One event at a particular time determining other event at, a, at, at another time. Classical sciences is uh, mainly uh, known after Newton. What Newton uh, says is this, that in a closed system, both energies and momentum are conserved. It doesn't say that there are no things, principles, or being external to the system. What it says is that both momentums and energies are conserved in a closed system. Now, we have to look at another scientist called Laplace. Laplace is a picture of sciences. What he says is that he added one more principle to the Newtonian principle of sciences, that is the principle of closures. And this Laplace principle of science has some features. The first one is that the universe is closed. 
Second, the universe is a continuum of space and time. Third reason is that every event in the universe has two causal histories. The sense of even that precede it and give rise to it. Another one is that the chance of event that it initiated and give rise to it. The fourth reason is that any event in the universe is explained in terms of other events in the universe. And the fifth feature is that given a natural law and some circumstances at a particular time, we can determine the corresponding event at some time in the future that we call it determinisms. Now to look at the relationship between classical science and whether it rules out miracles, then we need to look at whether or not the universe is closed or open is a question science should investigate. It is not a Question that science can investigate whether the universe is closed or open. That question comes in the domains of philosophy and religions or theology. Let's look at the Christian uh, views on miracles. According to, the, according to the Christian faith, there is God and He is transcendental to the universes. That means He is outside the universes and he is imminent in the universes. That means he is everywhere in the universes. Now, according to the Christian faith, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving. And he related to his creation in that manner, in the capacities. Let's say a dead being raised from the dead as a miraculous event. Then how do the Christian explain that miraculous event? We say that God is the creator of the natural laws. Then to bring the dead to life again, God can't instill the biological laws, the biological mechanisms recall for life. And if God can give that those things into the dead, then the dead can come to life again. That means God used natural laws to bring the dead alive again. Then the atheists will say that, yeah, even human beings use natural laws to manufacture this rocket and then propel it against gravity. Then that Human activities is in many ways similar to God in the Christian way uh, raising the dead from the uh, dead. Then how do we differentiate these two? Because the atheists will say that middle class event violate natural laws. Now the the Explanation is that the dead being raised from the dead is explained in terms of 
God, super, supernatural being who is not fully content in this natural world. That means the dead being raised from the dead cannot be, is not possible through natural mechanisms or natural law. Well as the human activities of propelling a rocket outward is explained entirely in this natural world. Natural law in this natural world, human being in this natural world. Well as that of the dead being raised from the dead is explained in terms of God who is outside these universes. And again, the other way to uh, Approach that question is that miraculous event may seem to us violate natural laws, but to God it may not seem to be. That means uh, classical science doesn't rule out miraculous event because it cannot it is it cannot investigate the questions whether the universe is closed or open. Well, it's great to hear that you are explaining that science is not contradict with miracle. Now, the next question we'd like to ask you, uh, is that classical science, does classical science not contradict miracle? What about modern science, namely the quantum physics? Talk about this contemporary science we talk about mainly quantum physics. This quantum physics is uh, expressed during the laws of probabilities. That means there is no certainty. We can say an event is probable or improbable. Now let's look at how this has been conceptualized. Example, Quantum events or behaviors are expressed during the laws of, of probabilities. That means in a quantum world, we don't talk about certainty. That means quantum event coming out about in a certain way. We can talk about 70%, 80%, 1% or 2%. That means a quantum event to bring about another quantum events, we can talk only in terms of being probable, maybe or may not be. That means 100%, we cannot guarantee 100% certainty of bringing about a quantum events during another quantum events. Now, looking at that very logic of, of uh, quantum physics, we could see that it is a closure or its support, the possibility of miraculous events, as many of the mainstream religion believes, including Christians. Now, looking at the natural laws, natural events, natural mechanisms in the universes, the possibilities of miraculous event. is very low. That means it could be 0 0.09 even percentage, one percentage, two percentage. It cannot be more than 50 percentage. But when we bring in the possibilities of God or the existence of God as the mainstream religion believe, who is outside this universe, there is a transcendent and who is imminent that means everywhere in this universe, who is all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing, then the possibilities of Mary class even just suit up to say 90% or 100 percentages. So, quantum fix uh, doesn't rule out the possibilities of miracle, rather it's underlying logic lend support to the possibilities of a class event. 
Okay, that's very well explained about the question whether uh, miracles are contradicted with modern science. So we come to the next question. Coming thus far about miracle in science, having come to learn that science in its incarnation is classical in modern forms, does not contradict miracle. Why do theists believe in miracle and atheists deny miracle differ so much on their take on science and miracle? To look at the conflicting views between atheists and theists with respect to a middle class event, we need to look at their philosophical presuppositions. Their philosophical presupposition is that atheists say that there's no God and hence rule out the possibility of miracles. Theses believe that there is God and hence allow the possibilities of miracles. Let's give an, an example. Suppose there is a miraculous event happening in front of atheists and theses. Then how would they interpret this event? The atheists who does not believe in God will say that that were even occurring in front of him to be an illusion. And he will say that it is not real. Well as Thesis, who believe in God, who is all loving, all knowing, all powerful, will say that that matter class even is real. And it manifests the glory of God. Now, one thing that comes into my mind is what C.S. Lewis, the authors of Chronicle of Narnia, or Mere Christianity, say is that what we bring, uh, the way we The way we look at the universe or event depends upon the philosophy that we bring into the observations, into our seeing of the universes. That means theses and atheists differ on their philosophical presuppositions that make them interpret middle class event differently. Why is that majority of Christians perceive evolution as conflicting to their theistic belief? I will give uh, two answers to the questions. The first answer is that many Christians uh, who see evolution as incompatible with uh, their Christian faith read Genesis as a scientific treatise, as a science textbook, especially the book of Genesis. And they read it as uh, today's uh, uh, scientific cosmological theories. But that is a misleading way of reading the Bibles because the Bible talk about God's realities and, and human realities and God covenanted relationship with human beings and his creations. So, the first point I give is that this conflicting versions of the relation between evolution and Christian faith is that many Christians read Genesis as, or the Bible, as scientific books, whereas well the Bible is a book of salvations. The second reason is that evolution has been used as a vehicle by many atheists to promote atheism. For example, Richard Dawkins and his comrades use evolution to attack the churches, to attack the Christian faith, and to attack religions. So, seeing that 
ev evolution being used to promote atheism by many atheists. Many Christians happen to conceptualize that evolution is incompatible with Christian faith or is in conflict with Christian faith. I think to me that is a wrong perception of the relations between the two. Well, we have been discussing so many other questions. We have finally come to the conclusion. So in conclusion, what suggestions may you give to Christians, especially those who are averse to evolution? As a part of the conclusions of the talks, I would say that I don't uh, uh, advise or recommend the audience that evolution is true or false, or I don't claim that you should believe in evolution or not. But I would like to uh, leave some points as a part of uh, suggestions as to how we may conceive uh, science and religions, evolution and Christian faith especially, relationship. The first point is that there are two books that God created. The first book that he created is the Bible, where it is mentioned God's reality, human realities, and God's covenant relationship with human being and his creations. The second book that he created is Natures, the book of Natures. That the book of Natures has to be known through sciences. Example, the origins of human being, the origin of the universe has to be known through sciences. So when we try to know what has to be known through science, through scriptures, that is where confusion arises. The second point is that we need to look, understand the beauty of our being created in the mess of God. Our being created in the mess of God means that we are intelligent beings who can know the truth about the natural world that God has created. It is the delight of God and the delight of human beings to know those truths. If you question that science cannot give us our origins and development and the universe's origins and its development, that means you are some way questioning our creator in the midst of God. Because since we are created in the midst of God, we come to have sciences. And science, including evolution, happen to be there, happen to be there to, to know, to help us know the truth about the natural world, including ourselves, our, our physical mechanism, biological me mechanisms, etc. And the mechanisms of the universes and everything in it. So if you question science and evolutions and doesn't believe that they can really truth about our physical physics or biological physics, that means you are some way questioning the truth about our creation in the midst of God. And the third point is that the Christians are realists in the sense that we believe that there are invisible things. And also that we can know through about those invisible things. As yes, our discussion is on science and evolution, and Christian, let me talk about this. If you don't believe in science and evolution, 
then you are some way anti-realists. You are in many ways affiliating to or supporting postmodernism, which claim that we cannot know absolute truth about the world, or which entirely claim that there are no absolute truth. Whether the Christian faith at its heart claim that there are absolute truth. So, the point is, if you are a Christian, a realist, and if you are an anti-realist with respect to science and evolution, that means you are self-contradicting. That means you cannot be a realist and anti-realist at the same time with respect to truth. You should believe in absolute truth and believe that science and evolution can reveal absolute truth about the world. The fourth point that I want to mention is that intellectual integrity. As I have mentioned, God has created two books, Bibles, we call scriptures, and nature which we know through sciences. There are biblical truth and there are scientific truth. Both these truth are created by God. So, if, would, if truth in these two books are created by God and they are there for us to explore, then truth and truth cannot contradict, cannot conflict, because both are truth and they are created by God. So that means, with respect to truth, we have to maintain this, we have to maintain this intellectual integrity, accept this both truth as reflecting the image of God and believe that they complement each other rather than conflict each others. Because the scientific truth are true created by God and then we know these beautiful natural laws, beautiful complexity, true expressions, true mathematical equations or physical equations, then we come to have a sense of of, of the mind of God. So scientific truth and biblical truth they complement each other. And we need to maintain, maintain intellectual integrity in a sense that we accept both this truth and appreciate it and reveal and become closer to God. The fifth point that I want to mention is intellectual humility. And this is a very, very, very crucial point. Many of us happen to uh, go walk the extra mile unnecessarily. Our being, uh, our God, the God that we worship is all-knowing, all-loving. That doesn't imply that we are all-knowing. That means there are truth, especially truth about uh, sciences, including evolutions, those has to be known through appropriate training and education. But many Christians happen to uh, make liberalist, liberal comment on those uh, scientific, on science and evolution without proper trainings. So, in this case, intellectual humility is highly needed. What I mean is that we need to be, have the uh, ability to admit that there are truth that we cannot know because we are not trained in that traditions. 
And this is silent because even in Roman it says that don't think yourself beyond what you are. That means all knowing, all loving, being infallible, all these attributes only to God. And if you try to be all knowing just because you have some, you are a Christian or you have some kind of theological training or because you have so much passion about God. And if you, and with that, uh, best is if you try to claim that you are all knowing and try to comment on science and evolution without, uh, without uh, training in those fear, that means you are some way trying to be like God. So intellectual humility is needed in these cases. And the sixth point that I want to mention is that we need to make this distinction. There are sciences and there are scientists. And there are Scientists who are popular of sciences. Now, what I mean by this is that when scientists, let's say, at least like Richard Dawkins, when they talk about science as a scientist, they have to be believed. But when they talk about science as a popular of science, what I mean by this is that they use science, including evolution, to promote the atheism. They go beyond the bounds of sciences. So we should not try to derive the picture of science looking at those popular of sciences who have their own ideology to promote evolution and sciences uh, to promote their uh, atheism. So let's make the distinction between scientists and scientists who are popular of sciences. The sixth point that I want to uh, mention is that, or the last point, there are core teachings of Christian faith with all Christian irrespective of denomination beliefs. Example, God created, God created the universe and everything in it is believed by all Christians, respective of all denominations. <coughs> but there are different accounts as to how God brings about his creation, namely the young are creationists, the old arcasonisms, intelligent design, and evolution. These different accounts as to how God bring about the universe is not as fundamental as the belief that God created the universe. What I mean is that you can believe in evolution, or you can believe in young arcasonisms, or you can believe in intelligent design, and still be a Christian. To give, to elaborate on this more, every Christian believes that there will be final coming of Jesus Christ. And that is very fundamental to the Christian faith. You can't be a Christian if you don't believe in that. But there are different accounts as to how this will happen. Namely, the accounts of premillennialism, millennialism, and postmillennialism. You can believe in any of these and still be called a Christian. What I mean by bringing this eschatology end time is to explain, is to uh, say that. There are core Christian belief believe which are fundamentals and which every Christian has to believe in order to be Christian. But we can differ on 
some uh, on some accounts as to how those uh, things can come about. As I say, you can believe in evolution, you can believe uh, in uh, interior design, you can believe in young art Christians and be a good Christians as much as uh, those other uh, Christians who believe in uh, the other alternative accounts. So what I mean is that let's try to uh, figure out what are the fundamental beliefs of Christians and what are non-fundamental beliefs in Christianity. So in that way, we can have a coherent and systematic uh, uh, understanding about science and religion relationship. Thank you so much, Len, for the wonderful explanation. I do believe this would be a great eye-opening and also enlightening to many people. This is going to be forever burning questions. Is science and religion a conflicting idea? We have heard from one of our scholars, Len. Thank you so much for your time. We are glad to have you here in the studio.